so this right here in the center is the mouth, I believe. Um, and then these plates must just be for protection. Um, and I'm guessing that they kind of fold back and can move them around because bat stars will exude their stomach out of their mouth and engulf prey <laughs> and then digest it uh, outside of their body even. Hello and welcome. I'm Chris Chase with the Western Flyer Foundation. In this episode, we're going to step back from the restoration and we're going to explore the why. Why is the Western Flyer Foundation so committed to restoring the Western Flyer? So much time and effort put into just fixing up an old fish boat. And if you've been following along for a while, you definitely know that, that the Western Flyer played a very prominent role in the writings of John Steinbeck. And you may even know that when this restoration is completed, she'll be used as an educational and research platform from Sitka, Alaska, all the way down to the Sea of Cortez. And if you've been following along, you know I'm super into some of the stories that surround the restoration restoration. And it's in this episode, I want to bring one of those stories to life to try to help explain that why. I want to introduce you to Andrea Dingledine. Andrea's life work has brought her right to the intersection of what the Western Flyer Foundation is all about. That stir curiosity, the intersection of art and science. Her professional career as a marine biologist, coupled with her lifelong passion as an artist, have set her up perfectly to be a scientific illustrator. I was attracted to science illustration from a really young age, actually. I loved both science and art um, and drawing organisms that I was seeing in my backyard or on trips and travels with my family. So it's really something that's been a part of me for a very long time. Um, nowadays, for me, going out and field sketching is kind of a personal practice. Um, it's, it's really important for me to build my knowledge and be refreshed on certain critters that I haven't seen in a long time. And then sometimes that does translate to doing work for other people or for scientists and researchers and marine labs. Scientific illustration has been around as long as humans have walked the earth. The earliest cave artists were of sorts the first scientific illustrators, drawing on cave walls what they saw in the world around them. Leonardo da Vinci's study of plants, animals, and the human body could easily be called scientific illustration. And of course, one of history's most famous naturalists, Charles Darwin, along with his collecting, often recorded much of what he saw with an illustration. I would guess nearly every textbook you've ever opened is filled with illustrations trying to break down and explain the world around us. Scientific illustration is a kind of bridge between art and science, making the world around us easier to understand. In the case of the Western Flyer, in her trip to the Sea of Cortez, it was the writings of John Steinbeck that brought Ed Rickett's science to life. Much like those first cave paintings telling the story of man's relationship with the natural world, Steinbeck's words illustrated the journey to the Sea of Cortez for each of us to enjoy. I once heard a prominent Steinbeck scholar tell a room full of the country's top scientists that every scientist needs a Steinbeck to bring their work to life. In steps the scientific illustrator. It's that relationship between the scientist and the artist that's at the core of the Western Flyer Foundation mission, and it continues to propel us forward. I get asked a lot as a science illustrator is, you know, it's a lost art form in some ways, but I just say that's not correct. Um, there's new ways of illustrating. There's animation that can show things uh, in a different form that keeps people's attention. Um, and then also, why not take a photograph is a great question. Uh, science illustration can show 
hidden structures, so it can show external morphology and shapes on the outside of an organism, and then it can glow through to the internal anatomy at the same time. And that's something a photograph can't do. So when I take students down here, um, you know, we kind of just jump in feet first <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, they're just tasked with observing something closely and trying to replicate it in a drawing, um, given whatever style and materials they want to use. Uh, and then I'm there just to provide some information if they have questions, but I also encourage them to ask their own questions. So when they're drawing, if they are thinking about a certain part of that organism, uh, then they might jot down a question to themselves and then they're tasked with going home and trying to answer that also. Yeah, so this is a kelp crab, uh, scientific name Pugetia producta, and this is actually a female, I believe. <laughs> go back in there. There we go. So I like to bring a little container with me uh, just so that I can collect something for a little brief amount of time um, and have it submerged in water so that it's able to breathe and it's at a comfortable temperature. Um, and sometimes I'll even refresh the water dish a couple of times to make sure that it's got oxygen and it's happy enough. Um, and then obviously at the end, let it go where you found it. Um, but then I just kind of start generally by getting out my pencil and eraser <laughs> and uh, just going for overall shapes. So maybe just starting with the carapace back here. Um, and you don't have to draw it in the position that she's in. Uh, you can start with the carapace and then kind of draw one or two legs and just that might be the only thing that you study that day um, and the only thing you have time for. Cool. So um, I like to work with watercolor personally uh, because it's pretty non-toxic and transportable. Um, so I've got a watercolor palette, which I'll get into maybe later. Uh, that's very clean right now. Yeah. It's not normally clean. <laughs> um, and then I've got a little watercolor journal um, that I like to fill with sketches and it's just kind of my place to experiment uh, with different techniques and to jot down notes for science illustrations that I create in the studio. Uh, so the practice of field sketching is just that, it's practice. Um, and it helps me with my artistic skills and my observation skills as well. Um, and not all of my field sketches end up turning into some final illustration, um, but it's nice if I have to do an illustration of a particular species and I've already done a field sketch, I can refer to those notes and um, color swatches and make sure that I'm getting things accurate when I'm using photos in the studio to draw from as well. So it's really just about approaching it with a new perspective and like you were you're going to try and draw something like you were going to describe a species to someone who had never seen it before yeah so i might even measure a little bit with my pencil um, if i was going to just focus on its carapace which is this back portion that looks kind of like a shield i might just generally compare how tall it is to how wide it is Ooh, cool. um, and that'll help me get kind of the first marks on my paper and it's about as tall as it is wide, I think. Yeah. So I usually just make a few little tick marks and that's gonna be where I draw the carapace. <laughs> and then crabs are nice because they're really symmetrical. <laughs> so you could even draw a little line down the middle. And then it's got like all of these different points, right? It's got a few, a few shield-like points, so. You could even measure like, okay, these two points, how far down are they from the very top part of the crab, approximately. Mm -hmm. So to do that, you're just kind of holding your pencil up and putting your finger where it ends. Exactly. Cool. You got it, Emily. <laughs> you could just draw half of it and you'd have all the information you needed because you've got one side and the other side is just the mirror image. Ah, that's a good point. That's... Now the legs, 
seem like they're going to be very tricky. Do you have any pointers? They are tricky. <laughs> <laughs> and she's moving too. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's okay if you just are collecting little bits and pieces too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get the entire organism in one sketch. Um, you could just focus on one leg and count the number of segments that are there. That's still going to give you a lot of information about the organism. Oh, cool idea. Okay. We could draw that separately too. Mm -hmm. It is really important to make sure that you do have respect for living creatures. Um, I do carry a dish down. Um, and that is to make sure that the animal that I'm drawing remains happy and refreshed. Um, I do like to refresh the water in the dish every 20 minutes or so, if possible. And I try and keep animals captive for as little time as possible as well. Um, and then for returning them, I definitely try to return them to the same spot where I found them. Uh, if I've flipped over any rocks, there's lots of organisms that live on the underside of rocks as well. So it's important to flip those rocks back over and place them in the same spot mm -hmm. where they were. Um, that way nothing is exposed to the sunlight that's not supposed to be exposed to the sunlight. That's a great point. All right. Is that our model three? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you want to carry the dish or? All right. Oh, it's definitely dropped a fair amount. <laughs> so where do we find her around here? Yeah, I believe right by this little rock. It looks like she could go underneath there if she wanted to hide. I think another great thing about drawing something from nature is that it really just forces you to observe it more closely than you would if you were just poking around the tide pools on a normal day. Yeah, so if you're trying to get started field sketching, I wouldn't tackle something as complicated as this to start out. You might grab a leaf or a shell or something that isn't going to move on you um, and just take the time to sit with it for a while and sketch it out. You can measure things with your pencil and block out the proportions and then just loosely sketch and then start to define the lines a little bit more. You saw me use pen here with this kelp crab, and I feel like that helps me solidify a sketch and kind of define what the edges are. Uh, but you could just use graphite and um, watercolor together, and that would be totally fine, or just graphite. Um, but definitely start with something that is interesting to you that you'd like to observe closely and something that's not going to move. And then once you've got practice under your belt, you can move on to more complicated animals and plants and start to really delve into asking questions about your subjects. When I'm out field sketching, I'm not just focused on creating a beautiful image. I'm also trying to record a lot of scientific information um, as well as what my experience is that day. So I might take notes on my location or the weather or the height of the tide. Um, and then I can delve a little bit deeper once I have a few illustrations going. And I can start asking questions or labeling parts of organisms. So you might not know right off the bat when you're drawing something what certain structures are, but it's definitely something that you can look up later. Um, for this page, I've focused on a particular species of nudibranch that I saw in the tide pools last weekend. This is Peltodorus nobilis, the false sea lemon. So there are a few programs for science illustration in 
this country. Um, I'm not sure if there's any internationally. I don't know of those. But locally, we have one at CSU Monterey Bay. And that's a graduate program in science illustration. There's also one in Washington, and I believe one at Yale. But that's not the only way to get into science illustration. If you have a passion for it, you don't necessarily have to go to school to learn how to be a science illustrator specifically. Maybe you have skills as a scientist, and you're actually really good at art, on the other hand, as well. So you can combine those two loves into a career in science illustration, even without getting a specific certification or degree in that. Yeah, so it was created for the Puget Sound Partnership, which is a Washington State agency. Um, and they release a kelp plan every year for conserving and protecting waters that are important for all of the different species of kelp that live in the Puget Sound. So I was hired to work closely with a scientist to ensure the scientific accuracy of all of these species and then compose them together into a poster that people can hang on their walls or that can be used for identification purposes. That's it, the end of another chapter in the rebuilding of the Western Flyer. I gotta say, I had a great time hanging out with Andrea and Emily down in the tide pools of Monterey Bay. It was just a great time, and thank you for letting me kind of voyeur in on your world. And I will definitely put a link in the description box to all the social media around this one, to Andrea's website, lots of great content there, to her Instagram account, which she updates pretty regularly, so worth checking out. And the Western Flyer has a new website, so I'll put a link in the description box to that. And, uh, oh, I almost forgot one thing. This t-shirt, I got one on, Andrea had one on in some of the video. This is actually an illustration she did of an octopus holding, I think you can see the flyer up here, the Western flyer in its arm there. So I'm just in the process of printing some of these up. I will have them available on our website. I'll make an announcement on this channel, but probably going into the, the early spring, at least another couple of weeks before they're available. But anyway, till the next episode, next video, thanks for watching. I was like seven or eight maybe <laughs> when I drew that. <laughs> That's awesome.